Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here at the lotus feet of the Lord Shifts and the blessings of all the senior devotees. I'll try to speak something today on the topic of how cause effect works in this world and how the Lord intervenes. So I'll speak this in three broad points. First is I'll explain how the cause effect connection is not as simple as we may think. Second is that how does Krishna intervene in this cause effect connection? And last is how we while practicing bhakti at our level can expect Krishna's intervention. So here the context is quite dramatic but the explanation is very philosophical. The context is that Prahlad is being pounced upon by vicious scary demons and with their weapons they are about to kill him and it is you know, if a murderous mob pounces on some people and at that time we, we would expect action you know what, will, what does this person do does they, do they run away what, what happens but it is said that he is protected and so that in that dramatic context of Prahlad being attacked he is protected and how he is protected that explanation is given in this verse and the explanation itself requires some some elaboration so the explanation requires an explanation we could say in general in the scriptures there is a narrative and within the narrative there are there are lessons there are philosophical points drawn from the narrative but often those philosophical explanations are addressed with context to the current audience at that time. So certain ideas might be easily understood by the people at that time. Say for example if we say Krishna's, Krishna's lips are as beautiful as bimba fruit. Now today we don't even know what is bimba fruit. So the context, so there is a universal principle, there is an explanation which is given, given using certain contexts. So those contexts need to be understood carefully. So the first point relates with how, which I am going to discuss, relates with how cause effect works in this world. So the example given here is that all the weapons of the demons could not hurt Prahlad, who was absorbed in the Lord. And certain characteristics of the Lord are described over here. Pare Brahmanya Khilatmani Anirdeshe. So we'll talk about the characters a little talk about the characters a little later, but he none of the weapons hurt him, just as the good activities of a person without good karma do not bear any fruit. Now it's interesting that the example, let's try to understand what is the example given over here. See, we all talk about a cause effect correlation. And that's how we function at a very basic level. Now, if somebody's child comes back home uh, with very poor grades, then the parents will ask, what happened? Did you study well for the exam? If a child comes back with a black eye on their face, on the eye, what happened? He says, no, I just got a black eye. What do you mean you just got a black eye? Did you fight with someone? You got an infection? What happened? So we implicitly understand that there is a cause-effect connection in the world. Nobody functions, we cannot function without a cause of a connection being the implicit basis of our functioning. However, the cause effect is not always straightforward. Although we say that the principle of karma is that to every action there is a reaction. But it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence always. It is not necessary that I will do action A and I will get result B. Now, why is it not like that? Because there are multiple factors involved. We could call those factors as four Ds. Four Ds is duty plus desire, sorry, duty plus destiny plus duration leads to the desired result. So we do our duty, we do whatever is our karma. Then after that, destiny has to be favorable. 
and when the destiny is favorable then the required time duration has to pass the duty plus destiny plus duration leads to the desired result you could call this as karm in sanskrit as karma plus daiva plus kala leads to phala the desired result so that i can start with some simple example say if somebody wants to plow a land and get some harvest they may plow the land that's their duty but the rains have to come that is destiny and then after that there will be the past passage of time till the harvesting season comes and only after that they will get the harvest so quite often when we act we overlook these two factors the destiny and the duration i think my action duty and result so sometimes we try to we are having some conflict resolution and we are trying to persuade someone to do something and we speak and speak and speak and the person just doesn't understand and one day we talk and suddenly that person gets persuaded or we talk the same point to two people one person sees it immediately the other person doesn't see it doesn't get the point why does it happen like that if our persuasive skills are so good that we could persuade one person why are we not able to persuade the other person sometimes we ourselves share krishna consciousness now we might if we are going and distributing books we might speak exactly the same sentence to two people same sentence same presentation same book maybe same setting also but one person takes it another person does it so now in this case we can say that oh each person has their own mindset and some people understand some people don't understand that's true but the point is that our action and the result are not immediately correlated and here we could attribute it to that person's particular mindset but there are many situations where we might not be able to attribute it directly to any particular person intervening say we decide to drive from one place to another and we plan i'll reach there in 30 minutes and once one day we reach in 30 minutes but the next day there's a traffic jam there's heavy traffic and it may take us 3 hours to reach the same place many times in india when we travel from say delhi to mumbai the flight takes one and a half hours but from mumbai to go to the temple takes 3 hours 4 hours sometimes that <laughs> if the traffic is bad so what happens is that our actions and the results from them are not intrinsically correlated at the immediate level every action will produce a result but that result may not, may not come immediately when that result will come depends on other factors and those factors involve our own past karma so for every action's result to come it's not just present karma it's present karma plus past karma produces a result and this is what often causes great mystery and frustration for many people even in the material field some people say i am working as hard as that person i am as talented as that person but they are getting all the lucky breaks and i just get the breaks i i just keep breaking down why is it happening like this so it's, it's because it's not just this life's our immediate karma so we might do a particular activity but may not get the result if the past karma is also not favorable now of course it is not that the past karma's role is always equally prominent that is where life becomes unpredictable that's in some cases we could say that the present karma might have a 100% or 99% role and past karma might have 1% role in some cases the present karma might have 1% role and the past karma might have 99% role say if somebody on a cold winter night eats 10 ice creams and after eating those ice creams what happens next morning they say ice cream <laughs> they have terrible pain they have a sore throat now somebody else might also eat 10 ice cream and nothing may happen to them if they are particularly healthy 
bad, nothing might happen to you, but this person might be in terrible pain. Now when they are in terrible pain, should we say, oh, you are, why are you in pain like this? It's because of past karma. Well, yeah, it's past karma, but it's past night's karma. <laughs> it's not some remote karma. So on the other hand, some people, uh, they, uh, even if they do something right, they may, they may eat something a lot of ice creams, but still their health might just stay steady. Nothing happens to them. So, if the past karma is favorable, even our negative actions may not produce some results, negative results. On the other hand, if the past karma is unfavorable, then even our positive activities may not produce positive results, and a small negative action may produce a lot of negative results. Some people have an intrinsically very healthy body. So, they might, and some people have a sickly body. If somebody has a sickly body, say a slight uh, inappropriate diet, maybe they eat one item which they should not eat or a little bit of that item. Some people have say allergy to some particular substances and then just inhale that substance or eat that substance and then they might just, you know, throw up or they might become very sick. So a lot of reaction can happen to them. On the other hand, some people who are very, having a very healthy body, of, uh, what happens, they treat, their, they treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. They just keep eating anything and everything and still they remain healthy and slim and nothing happens to them. Some people just eat a little, little bit more and their body balloons out. So why is this? That our immediate actions, they do affect, but they may not affect immediately. So the point being made over here is that the immediate cause is not the complete cause. And the immediate cause will not have an effect if the other factors are not favorable. So now in the case of somebody being attacked by weapons, it seems obvious. You know, if somebody is running towards somebody else with a knife or a spear and piercing them, they, they would be wounded, they will be killed. But the Bhagavatam is giving us this philosophical view this is not directly karma because it's bhakti and I'll talk about the difference in a few minutes. But the point the Bhagavatam is making is the immediate cause was present. The demons were charging towards Prahlad with their weapons. But because the remote cause was not favorable, therefore there was no effect. Although the demons attacked, but the attack had no effect. So in a sense the Bhagavatam is describing something miraculous in an analytical way. In a, you could say, a non-miraculous way. If somebody comes, if 10 people, 50 people come and attack a small child, what can that child do? A child would be defenseless. But here the child is protected. And this, we could say, is miraculous. How could a child survive like that? So. So the cause, I talked about the cause effect correlation in the world and how it works that the immediate cause is not the sufficient cause. Sometimes if the immediate cause and the remote cause are not together, then the immediate cause might be there but still the result might not come. So then uh, what is the mechanism? So how does Krishna play a role in the cause effect mechanism in the world? So in this case what has exactly happened is that something special is going on. We could say that the demons are coming to kill Prahlad and Prahlad is unaffected. So, taptasya pratividhir ihanja seishtas tavad vibho tanubratam tadupi kshitanam Prahlad Bharaj himself, later on in the ninth chapter, while offering prayers to Narasimhadev, explains this point. Bhalasya neha sharanam That, my dear Lord, even a child cannot be protected by the natural protector, say the father or the mother. A boat cannot protect a drowning person. And a medicine cannot heal a sick person if you do not allow it. So, that means there is a problem and there is an obvious solution to the problem. But the obvious solution to the problem will not work if tavad vibho tanubratam tadupekshitanam, if you do not want that solution to work. So, 
Prahlad Maharaj is having this vision and he is of course there talking in not the context of how he was protected but he is talking in the context of how uh, Hiranyakashipu despite all his wealth was not protected. His wealth and power and his boons was not protected. So there is an obvious or an immediate measure that we take and we are required to take it at a practical level. But the immediate cause is not the complete cause. And in the case of the Lord's intervention, how does he intervene? So some people say that in the past, people were very naive. They were pre-scientific, unscientific. They believed all these fairy tales. They didn't have a sense of logic. But we are logical now. However, it's not as simple as that. If we see, let's consider one of the most dramatic incidents of some miraculous intervention of Krishna, of the Lord in the world, that is the Govardhan Leela. Govardhan Leela. So now, Krishna lifts up a whole hill on just a little finger. Now this, can you see, how, how can anybody do like that? Sometimes some skeptical people say, you know, if, if say we have to lift something, see if I have to lift this book, if I have to lift it on my little finger or one finger, I'll have to place it right properly at the center. So, you know, in physics there is the concept of the center of gravity. And if only if the finger is placed steadily at the center of gravity and the finger is strong enough, then the book will be held. So, a skeptic might have ask, even if Krishna had the strength, to lift up Govardhan, how did he find the center of gravity of Govardhan to put his finger over there? Now Krishna does not have to find the center of gravity because he is the source of gravity. He is the source of gravity. The rule Maya Dhyakshena Prakriti Suyate Sacharacharam. So the laws of nature work under his supervision. Now what does this mean? That is it that the Vrajavasis were naive and they just believed a story or people at that time and Bhagavatam was told they believed a story? No, there is a questioning attitude that is there in the Bhagavatam itself. The 25th chapter, uh, the, if you see the Govardhan Leela is described in the 10th canto in 4 chapters, 24, 25, 26 and 27. So 24th chapter describes Krishna dissuading the Vrajavasis from doing the Govardhan Puja doing the Indra Puja and doing Govardhan Puja instead. 25th chapter describes the results. Indra gets angry and he showers down rain, hail, winds, thunderbolts and lightning. Everything. And he tries to cause flooding of the nearby river also, Yamuna. But through it all, Krishna protects the Vrajavasi by lifting the Govardhan. The 26th chapter is called by Prabhupada's wonderful Krishna. And in that chapter, the Vrajivasis go and ask Nanda Maharaj, that next chapter is Indra's prayer. So in that 26, 27 chapter section, the Vrajivasis ask, Krishna is a small boy, how could he lift such a big mountain? And the point is, the Vrajivasis are not, although they have themselves seen it happen, still they are asking for an explanation. So they are not just naively believing it. And what is the explanation that the Maharaj gives? So actually, when I was, when, when Krishna was born, Gargamuni had come. And Gargamuni had told me that this son, that your son, is just like Narayana. Is just like Narayana. Now Gargamuni did not want, Gargamuni did not want, as a Brahmana, he did not want to speak untruth. But he also couldn't speak the truth. So he couldn't tell Nanda Maharaj that actually this is not your son, this is the son of Vasudev. Mm -hmm. So what he did is, in a previous life, he was the son of Vasudev. Now previous life means, in this, you could say that Krishna had two distinct lives, the way he lived in Mathura and the way he lived in Vandavan were quite, quite different. So he just uses a different uh, twist to the meaning of previous life. And then he says, he doesn't say your son is Narayan, your son is as powerful as Narayan. So, of course, that is also true because he is the source of Narayana. But the point here is that Krishna doesn't necessarily, uh, that, that, that when Nanda Maharaj speaks this, that he is as good as Narayana, that's why he has such power. And when the Vrajivasis hear this,
as a whole is as powerful as another then they accept it expression or oh, then it makes sense so so the point here is that they are not just naively believing anything and everything but when they given when they are given explanation they are open to explanations of a higher order yes there are laws of nature and normally a heavy object cannot be lifted or to speak of lifting a hill but heavier than the object heaviest objects in this world are higher powers is a supreme being and somebody is as powerful as supreme being surely they can lift so so the modern science what it does is it claims causal completeness causal completeness means that cause effect can be completely explained in terms of the material world itself that okay this cause this effect this cause this effect now at one level it is true and they say that the laws of nature can explain everything there is a prominent scientist is a brilliant scientist in his own way stephen hawking he wrote a book called the grand design and in that book he claims now what is his idea of a grand now he is a atheist now what is the grand design he says this design is so grand because it does not require a designer require a designer the grandness of this design is that it doesn't require a designer that's absurd oh, he says no that's that, that's the grandness now in this book what he argues is now he's a brilliant scientist but he is also a pathetic philosopher and often scientists they overstep the jurisdiction and they start making philosophical claims so in his book he one of the one of the most uh, absurd statements is that if the laws of nature exist because the laws of nature existed the universe created itself Now, because of the because the laws of, now in now in this case laws of nature it doesn't talk about law of karma he talks about laws of physics like gravity and others because the law because of the laws of nature the universe created itself now again you could you could find many many faults with this but the point here most important thing is the laws of nature don't do anything the laws of nature simply describe how actions correlate with consequences how much is say 5 a how much is 500 plus 700 1200 yeah thank you do you have 1200 dollars in your pocket no just because you know 500 plus 700 is 1200 that doesn't allow to put 1200 dollars in your pocket so if you had 500 dollars in your pocket and somebody gave you 700 dollars then the laws of mathematics can tell you how many dollars will be there in your pocket isn't it the laws of mathematics don't produce any money if the laws of mathematics produce money all mathematicians would be millionaires isn't it so the laws of mathematics require the pre existence of certain certain objects on which certain transformations take place and then what will be the result of those transformations that is described by the laws of mathematics similarly the laws of physics they don't cause anything to happen after something exists and something causes it to change what will be the result of that change that will be described by laws of physics so that means that to first there are three things which remain unexplained and that's how god plays a role in the picture first of all where did the things which on which the laws are going to act where did those things come from mm-hmm. second is uh, how did the action the cause take place and third is where did the cause effect correlation come from i'll explain this in a different way say if uh, now currently in india the uh, cricket craze is becoming very high so suppose there is a world cup final match india and pakistan very arch rivals are playing and then the last ball somebody needs to hit it across the fence and the batsman is batting and the ball comes and they swing it bat and the ball goes over the fence for a six and then the then everybody celebrates and the match winning batsman is asked how did you hit the six 
on this last ball he said by newton's laws of motion <laughs> that is knowing yeah newton's laws of motion already is always there but newton's laws of motion didn't ex- don't explain why the bat the ball the batsman the bowler existed newton's laws of motion don't explain why the batsman chose that particular shot instead of some other shot newton's laws of motion can only explain that if this cause of this magnitude is there this effect will come about so the point i'm making is god is the overseer of the system so miracles are not against science miracles are above science we accept the validity of science but we also accept that there is something more beyond that so when somebody is being charged with weapons to hit them to kill them normally a sharp spear will go into someone's body and just pierce them kill them but and that's you could say this common sense you don't even know need laws of physics for that but the point is what we observe it is there is a causal connection but it's not always causally complete because the lord oversees the system and if the lord wants he can supersede the system he can suspend the system and that is his omnipotence so we don't deny the laws of nature but we don't de- we deny absoluteness to the laws of nature so they are there but there is something more beyond the cause of a connection so that is the second point that how does god intervene go in the in the causal connection in the world god sets up the system of causal connection god actually creates the things on which the cause of a connection will act and then god can intervene and suspend the cause of a connection if it is required that brings us to the last point that is okay how can we expect krishna's intervention in our lives we are trying to practice bhakti and do we the essential principle in the bhagavatam is not so much the miracles the miracles are dram- are not about dramatic so for example prahlad is being charged is being attacked and he is unaffected so we may say this is a miracle yes it is a miracle but the essential miracle is not that prabhu prahlad was protected the essential miracle is that prahlad was absorbed in the lord now even if he had even if the weapons had killed him the that it we could say it was tragic but if he had been absorbed in the lord that is the success in every action see, sometimes the scriptures describe that even those who are devoted may sometimes suffer may sometimes perish the ramayan describes how jatayu fought valiantly against ravan but he was killed the mahabharat describes how abhimanyu fought valiantly against the kauravas but he was killed of course the mahabharat also describes how ramayan describes how hanuman single handedly went into lanka and penetrated lanka and came came out victorious devastating single handedly the demoniac hordes of ravan and i also described how arjuna penetrated single handedly into the kaurava ranks and wrecked a walk killing jayadrat so the scriptures do talk about the devoted being victorious but the scriptures are not shy of talking about how the devoted sometimes meet with failure so why do the scriptures talk about this because the nature of the world is that sooner or later everybody will experience failure and even those who are devoted sometimes they may experience setbacks we look at shri prabhupada's life we see he was so phenomenally successful in sharing krishna consciousness across the world but if you look at his previous life there are so many times when so many things that he did didn't work out in fact almost everything that he did did it seemed that it backfired it didn't work out at least if not backfired so and if you look at the overall narrative of the bhagavatam itself it's if, if suppose somebody hear some maybe some adventure movie or something like that in watch is watching some adventure movie and say it says that in the beginning somebody is pronounced you are going to die in 70s and in the, there's a whole curse 
and the whole movie will be about how this person tries to escape that curse. But suppose somebody is pronounced you are going to die in seven days, and then that, by the end of seven days that person dies. So what is the movie over there? What is the miracle over there? So Prahlad is cursed to die in seven days, and after seven days he dies. So, so what happened? I Means what is the story? What is the what is the point of it all? So the point is that in those seven days, Prahlad became absorbed in hearing about Krishna. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, Parikshit Maharaj. Sorry, Parikshit Maharaj became absorbed in hearing about Krishna. So, the the essential miracle is absorption. Now, sometimes with our absorption, there might also be a miraculous reciprocation from Krishna, with the miracle being visible to the world eyes. That means, in the something very extraordinary might happen. So, Prabhupada's devotion is not just seen by the fact that he opened hundred and eight temples or wrote seventy books or travelled across the world fourteen times on victorious outreach tours, attracting millions and millions to Krishna. That is definitely glorious, but Prabhupada's miraculous devotion is also seen in the fact that despite having made with, met with repeated setbacks in his attempt to try to share Krishna Bhakti, still he was courageous enough to step on Jaladutta. And he stepped on Jaladutta, that one step of a 69 year old man going to a different country where he has never been before where he doesn't know anyone over there. You could, that one simple step of climbing onto the ship, you could say is one of the most courageous acts in human history. There's nothing, you might say there's nothing courageous, just stepping into a ship, you're not fighting against enemies. But Prabhupada was taking on a whole materialistic culture. So Prabhupada's absorption in Krishna, Prabhupada's dedication to serve Krishna, that itself is miraculous. And of course, Krishna's reciprocation came, that's, that's also miraculous. But if we restrict our understanding of Krishna's intervention to only Krishna's miraculous reciprocation, then if that reciprocation doesn't come, we'll start thinking, what is Krishna doing? I am doing so much, what is, why is Krishna not reciprocating? If say we are trying to share Krishna Bhakti, we go out and distribute books, we give classes, we, d- we do our part. And sometimes people may just take up immediately and sometimes people may not take up at all. So when if we think only when a lot of people take books, that's Krishna's miracle. Yes, it's Krishna's mercy, it's Krishna's miracle. But even if nobody takes books, but if we stay absorbed, if we say satisfied that I did my part, I did my best, then our capacity to stay absorbed in Krishna, that is also Krishna's mercy. In fact, at the end of our lives, how many people are there? It matters if the devotees are giving us blessings. But more important is, how much are we remembering Krishna? At the end of our life, our achievements are not going to matter. Ultimately, you can say our achievements are Krishna reciprocating in this world to uh, to reward us for our service. And that's good if we get that. But what is going to matter there is how much we are remembering Krishna. So, the, the essential miracle of devotion that is demonstrated by Prahalad is absorption. And if he is absorbed, he is already successful. Whether the weapons penetrated into his body or the weapons didn't penetrate into his body. So, so we also can strive, although we are far away from such absorption, but we can strive for that absorption in whatever service we are doing. It's ultimately, if we can engage ourselves in Krishna's service, that itself is our success. If we can spend this life engaged in Krishna's service, irrespective of whatever reciprocation we get, if we are satisfied in the service of Krishna, if satisfied in our absorption in Krishna, then we are already successful. Because that will prepare us for absorption at the time of death and that will take us to life's ultimate success. That's why Prahlad Maharaj is said to embody smaranam, the absorption in devotion through remembrance. And we can take that inspiration from him and also try to become similarly absorbed. 
by that absorption sometimes we'll get success sometimes we'll get failure if we get success we won't become elated and proud if we get failure we won't become dejected and depressed through both we'll move forward steadily na praharishet priyam prapya no dvijet prapya cha priyam sthir buddhi rasam modo brahma vid brahmani stata in 520 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that be equipoised in happiness and distress and keep persevering on the spiritual path and by that you will attain the supreme perfection so i'll summarize i spoke today on the topic of how cause effect works in this world and how krishna intervenes in the world's cause effect connection so first point i took is that here the miraculous incident prahlad is being pierced by weapons but nothing is happening to him so for this miraculous action a philosophical explanation is given that just as a person may do karma but not get any result good karma but no result why is that because although every action produces a result it's not necessarily a one to one or immediate correlation that is duty plus destiny plus duration yes duty plus destiny plus duration leads to desired result, desired result yeah so we often think just my duty and my result is result it's not that simple so i discussed several examples of how we might do our part and not get a result if the karma is not favorable at that if the destiny is not favorable so it's an unpredictable combination of present karma and past karma that combines to produce the result that we get okay then i talked about how krishna intervenes in the in the cause of a connection in the world so scientists try to claim causal completeness that everything that happens can be explained in terms of material laws of nature now this is not true because the laws of nature do not cause anything the laws of mathematics can explain how much money i have in my pocket if somebody gives me some more money but the laws of mathematics alone don't produce money so the even if the laws of nature are there still uh, even if all that we need on we still need an explanation of why something exists why that thing moves so that the laws of nature can predict what will going to happen on them and why those laws of nature exist also requires explanation so krishna oversees the system and krishna can intervene in the system when he wants so it's not that when miracles happen people are people are naive and believe anything and everything no even the prajivasis are logical and are asking questions how could krishna live to go over them go over them but they are open to explanations which the modern mind is close to so miracles are not illogical they are not against science they are above science and then last point i took is that how can we expect krishna's miraculous intervention it is not that when some immediate cause comes and there is no immediate effect we expect that you know, some danger is there and no, no we are not we are safe from the danger krishna can reciprocate miraculously but krishna's miracle most enduring miracle is that he gives us absorption in him absorption is the ultimate protection the reciprocation in terms of phenomenal success which sachila prabhupad got in the last 10 years of his life that's wonderful but prabhupad success was also that even with repeated failure he still stayed absorbed in krishna the scriptures describe miraculous success like say of arjuna haran hanuman but they also describe tragic failures as of abhimanyu and jatayu and the important point is they were all absorbed in the lord and if we cultivate absorption according to our capacity in our service then irrespective of whether we get success or failure in the world we will stay steady and we will attain the ultimate success of absorption in the lord at the time of death to be united with him thank you very much hare krishna this way comment this question this way you know we have the uh, in our um bhasha culture we have a method of like uh, trying to understand how this is in control and there's a famous verse well there's a dosha dara samsara but it is like that's also the method of the famous verse that said they were about to be like the day that uh it's faith that really determines
help us understand Krishna's control, like faith is, is vital, it, it, that it sustains us through all external circumstances. We keep faith, we trust in Krishna person. So uh, I'd like to, you to explain the relationship between the knowledge coming from uh, realized souls and Krishna in regards to deepening our faith or our trust in Krishna. Okay. There's so much explanation how Krishna is in control. Yes. So how is that connected to faith? Okay, so... Because in, in Western theology, faith is like a blank. You just, you just have faith. No explanations are needed. But yeah. that's not the right, the right faith, eh? That's true, Why yes. Yeah, so how do knowledge and faith relate with each other in the bhakti path? In fact, I'm going from here to New Zealand and I'm having a two-part seminar on this topic itself. So, so I'll mention three quick points. Uh, in Faith is definitely required and in fact, uh, the Bhagavad Gita says Shraddhava Labhate Gyanam. That it is in four point in four thirty nine he says that it is the faithful who gain knowledge. Mm. Mm. Now what does this mean? If we see in the sequence which you mentioned, Adav Shraddha Tatha Sadhu Sangat Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivritti, Nishtha Ruchi Asakti. So there are two words which can be correlated with faith. Mm. One is Shraddha and the other is Nishtha. Mm. Now Prabhupada translate Shraddha almost, at many places almost like favorable curiosity mm. or in I think in 1, 2, 12 in the Bhagavatam Tach Shraddha Dhana Munayo Jnana Vairag Yuktaya Pashyantya Atmanam Bhaktya Shruta Grahitaya In that verse Prabhupada translates Shraddha as the seriously inquisitive sage So initial faith is just that maybe something exists beyond all this. I'm looking at this world, I'm seeing this world, but maybe there's something more to life. So, just that openness, that curiosity, and not just a passive curiosity, a serious curiosity. I want to know if there's something more. And that is, actually, that's, we can correlate this Shraddha with Athato Brahma Jignasa. So often, faith is seen, especially in Western theology, and again, we don't want to reduce Western theology because Christianity is also very complicated and Christianity has also had many philosophical brilliant exponents also. But still, uh, it is often portrayed that faith, if you have faith, then no more questions, you just accept. But if you see the Vedic conception is faith means an openness, an inquisitiveness about spiritual reality. So, Shraddha and Brahma Jignasa are almost similar. It's not that I'm accepting whatever scripture describes out there, but I'm just accepting the possibility that something might be there out there, beyond what we see in this world. And with that inquisitiveness, if I want to know, how do I know? Then, Shraddhava Labhate Gyanam. It is, only if I believe that something exists, something may exist, not even something exists, I'm open to the possibility, then I'll explore it. So, uh, there was a famous, there's a famous atheist who said, theology is just a waste of government money because it's all dedicated to the study of a subject that doesn't exist. <laughs> now, this is just arrogance. How can anyone know that God, know for sure that God doesn't exist? Nobody can know that. So, the first point is, when, when in our tradition we talk about faith, it's more of curiosity and inquisitiveness. Is there something more? And then, after that, then by that, we gain some knowledge. Okay, this, is a, this book describes this, this book describes this, this book describes this. Then, after that, so first level of faith is inquisitiveness. Then second level of faith is, is practice the process to see whether what is described is true. And this brings us to the difference between reasonable faith and blind faith. So, the faith described in scripture is reasonable because it is, reasonable faith has two characteristics, it's sensible and verifiable. It's like when we go to a doctor, 
and say if I have stomach pain. And the doctor says, we have to cut, your, cut off your leg. He says, what? That doesn't make sense. The doctor says, oh, you've got acidity? Take these pills for the next three days, you'll be better. And that makes sense. So, when we see in the Bhagavad Gita or the Bhagavatam, what is being spoken is sensible. Although Krishna is God who is speaking, nowhere in the Bhagavad Gita does Krishna say to Arjuna, I am God, therefore accept what I am saying. Krishna gives reasoned arguments. One of my friends told me that he is planning to write a book on the Ten Commandments of the Bhagavad Gita. So I told him, please don't write a book like that. Because the whole Bhagavad Gita's mood is not of commandments. It's a mood of choices and consequences. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Now, deliberate and decide what you want to do. So the point I'm making is, the Bhagavad Gita outlines a process. I follow this process and the, there's, there's a reason, there's a reasoning. So it's sensible. It's like a doctor says, okay, you're having stomach pain because there's acidity. So the Bhagavad Gita answers questions in a reasonable way. You cannot necessarily say, people may argue that it's not conclusive. Yeah, okay. We cannot have conclusive knowledge about anything that way. We are finite beings. But it's a reasonable, at least it's worth exploring. And the second aspect of, the first aspect of reasonable is that before doing something, it makes sense. And second aspect of reasonable faith is it's verifiable. That means what is predicted happens. So now what, 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 what happens? This, is Bhagavad, this whole progression is also very, you could say, again, log, uh, again reasonable. That uh, first thing that will happen is anartha nivratti. That the unwanted desires in our heart will start decreasing. Now we may say, I have been practicing bhakti and still anarthas are there in my heart. Yes, they are there, but if we compare to maybe 5 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, definitely they are lesser. So, the verifiability is not necessarily at our level in terms of we will be able to see God. But the verifiability is that the unwanted desires will go down. And that itself is a very powerful transformation. So, if somebody has an acute disease, then the result might not be that, but of the treatment may not be that their, desert get, desert, that their disease gets completely cured. But at least some symptoms subside, some pain goes. At least this is working. So in that sense, there is verifiability. And almost anybody who practices Bhakti Yoga, chants Hare Krishna, tries to remember Krishna, they see a subsiding in their worldly desires. So that is verifiable. So sensible and verifiable. That is the second understanding of faith. And so with Shraddha we go to Bhajana Kriya and we experience Anartha Nivrutti. And then the faith that gradually develops is Nishtha. Nishtha is not just faith, if you want to separate it in English, it, we could call it as conviction. So it is a realized faith. Vishwanath Chakra Thakur in the Madhuri Kadamini gives a difference between the two. He says, Shraddha is like a banana tree. Banana tree. Any elephant can come or any, per, any person can come and shake it. But Nishtha is like a banyan tree. The banyan tree, it's almost impossible to shake it. So why is it impossible to shake? Because it, not necessarily one has seen Krishna. That is Ruchi, Bhava, Asakti, Prema is further ahead. But because one has experienced the results. At least I have experienced the subsiding of my anarthas. So it's like, suppose we take treatment from some doctor. And the doctor uh, say, and the doctor's treatment works for us. And after that, somebody comes and says, this doctor is a quack. This doctor is bogus. Well, you can say that the doctor is bogus, but the treatment is successful. So that means the doctor is not exactly malified or bogus. So that conviction is what we will gradually get as we practice bhakti. So because there is a there is a reasonable explanation and there is a tangible process and there is a project, predicted trajectory for transformation. So therefore, it's reasonable faith. And how does knowledge lead and co-faith correlate? Knowledge basically provides us like a pathway along which we will be moving. And to the extent we have knowledge, to that extent we can see the process working. Now some people we might just have Vishwanath Shakti says Swabhavaki Shraddha. So 
Swabhaviki means natural faith. So that basically means it comes from piety from a previous life. But for some people it is a Balen Utpadita Shraddha. That means some forceful preaching done by someone. Create some faith. But either way, if the person starts practicing Bhajana Kriya, starts practicing Bhakti, transformation will start happening. So for us, faith in that sense is more a matter of intelligent choice. It's not, we don't, we, we don't consider that faith and reason or faith and knowledge are opposed. Rather, it is it's symbiotic. With some faith, we acquire knowledge. With knowledge, we follow a process by which the faith deepens. With that faith, again, that knowledge, we get further clarity. And in that way, both move forward together and they culminate in love for Krishna. Okay. Thank you. Very nice explanation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Actions perform knowledge. Faith is one's knowledge. Yeah. Yes. If you act upon what you heard, you Mm-hmm. That knowledge becomes uh, yours, which becomes internal. Yes, perfect. Yes. So thank you very much, Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki. Gaur Premanandi. <laughs>